Good evening, and welcome to Advanced Church Growth Conference 2021. We feel that though the current events of our world have caused us to back up, rethink, and condense the Advanced Conference for you online, it will be no less impactful and relevant to your church and ministries. You will be equipped, challenged, and inspired to reach your community. God is advancing His church in these last days. He's getting us ready to see the greatest promise of end times. The unparalleled outpouring of the Holy Ghost in our families, our churches, our communities, and also our world. His greatest promises are just ahead. And His word will be fulfilled. Let's make sure we're ready for the harvest. I want to welcome everyone this evening to this second uh, evening uh, session uh, for Advance 2021. I welcome all the pastors. I welcome all the church leaders who are joining us tonight. Uh, you are our heroes uh, because you lead God's church in, in the greatest days that the church will ever have witnessed, and that is in the great days of harvest and revival. The Bible does not hide the fact that the last days will be full of signs, wonders, and miracles. And of course, the greatest end time promise that more people will be filled with the Spirit uh, and be a, uh, come into the kingdom of God that in any other time the church will have ever witnessed. These are very exciting times uh, to be a part of God's church. But these are also some of the most challenging times. But right in the middle of it all, God's church is carrying out his powerful plan. And that's why we've invited Dr. Gary McIntosh to meet with us this evening to discuss navigating the church through challenging times. Dr. McIntosh is very qualified to speak with us tonight uh, on the subject of church growth and, and these, these matters that we are facing, navigating our churches through difficult, through uncertain, through uh, the things that are happening in our world. Uh, in our communities. Uh, having, he has a bachelor's degree in Bible, uh, biblical studies, master's degrees in both pastoral studies and church growth studies, and a PhD in intercultural studies. Dr. McIntosh has served as president of the Institute of uh, American Church Growth, president of also the American Society of Church Growth. He's presently the professor of Christian Ministry and Leadership at Talbot School of Theology at Biola University. Dr. McIntosh has over 30 years experience in the field of church growth consultation and has consulted with over 1,200 churches representing some 87 denominations worldwide. With the, uh, his author's hat on, uh, he's published 26 books on church growth, uh, which uh, includes church growth, evangelism, leadership, pastoral ministry. Um, maybe the best part, though, the best part of Gary is his sweet wife, Carol, uh, whom I've had the privilege to meet, and what a team they are. He uh, resides in uh, Temecula, California, and we are glad to have him as part of Advance 2021. Welcome, Dr. McIntosh, this evening uh, to Advance. Thank you, Daryl. It's good to be with you and uh, with all of the pastors and other people who may be uh, watching this uh, online. Welcome, everybody, and it's great to be with you. Well, it's great to have you, and we look forward to uh, the things that we're able to accomplish uh, via uh, the webinar and the online, this wonderful event called Advance. Uh, our goal is to help our pastors is to get into the lives of on the, the, the ground level lives of those who lead in the church. Um, and so many don't have answers during these times, but there are answers, there's some direction, and, and we wanna help and assist in any way we can. So let's just dive right into the deep end tonight. Um, for years, our churches have learned to do things a certain way with the natural changes that come along with time. But we've seen major changes take place almost overnight. There is no preparation. Uh, you know, we had no manuals, no books to go and read to see how to accomplish things during these times. So how has this COVID-19 pandemic changed the way that we do church? 
And obviously the major change uh, is that we went from meeting face to face and having most of our ministries and programs be face to face ministries to overnight we were online and having to scramble to figure out uh, how to offer worship services and how to provide pastoral care and small groups and outreach. And I mean, uh, I mean, it's just incredible. You know, most churches prior to uh, us having to, to uh, quit meeting face to face, most churches honestly uh, were not doing online worship services. Uh, some churches barely had a website and um, some churches were getting into online uh, financial giving. Uh, but most churches honestly hadn't even uh, started talking about online giving at, at that time back in March or so. Um, some churches did have a Facebook page where they tried to connect people, you know, for some sort of um, fellowship or mainly for giving announcements and information out about future events at church and programming. Uh, but very few churches we're prepared, as you said. I mean, very few churches. And then overnight, uh, we literally had to scramble and uh, we had to learn things like Zoom. I mean, who had even heard of Zoom <laughs> prior yeah. to March? You know, I mean, in the educational environment, we were using Zoom, but most churches, you know, people had not used it at all. And, and now Zoom's a household name. Uh, some churches and pastors were hesitant to even think about online services and online giving and things of that nature. Um, and it probably would have happened, but it might've taken five, 10, 15 years for many churches to create those changes and actually enter that technological door. But now we've done it, haven't we? I mean, we're talking maybe uh, seven, eight months and now almost all churches have some sort of online service, online giving, online pastoral care, online small groups. I mean, that, I mean, it's just, uh, as you said, I mean, it's just phenomenal uh, how quickly we've had to adapt. Uh, and we've done it. So that's the good thing. We've actually got more viewers sometimes watching our worship service online than we had in physical attendance uh, prior to COVID-19. Uh, now we don't there's a lot we don't know about those online viewers you know we don't know sometimes how long they're watching or how committed they are or uh, what's going on uh, we don't even know who they are sometimes and I think that's some of the challenges uh, you know we, we've got online viewers but are we really engaging them in a way that uh, will make long-term uh, commitments and uh, connections. It amazes me how quickly the church can change uh, if yeah. we need to. You know, we're adaptable. The church has adapted throughout 2,000 years of church history, you know, through plagues and uh, wars and all kinds of things. So this is nothing new. It's new for us, but it's not new for the church, that's for sure. That's a great point that it's it certainly is uh, a, a great challenge that we feel. Um, but uh, if, if you read the book of Acts, you don't have to read very far to find the great challenges that they faced. Yeah, absolutely. Um, things that were just incredible. In fact, most of the time their lives were in jeopardy. Uh, we have it uh, mainly here in the US have faced some of those things, but there's no guarantees. But we are guaranteed that there's going to be a, a church, and the church is going to be strong, and the church yep. will, will be victorious. Those are the promises of God. And, and today, if we had to tell anyone anything who was serving in the kingdom, it would be to, that your best days are ahead. The world does not dictate the advancement and the success of God's kingdom. And we've got to remember to separate those two things. And it is a challenge, certainly. The pandemic has changed uh, church in the way we do it. Uh, you know, as you say, you know, uh, Jesus said, I will build my church and uh, the gates of hell will not, uh, you know, uh, overpower it. So uh, the church is still advancing. I do think there's a great opportunity here. and We don't want to miss this. Uh, now's the time to make some changes. 
and to take advantage of the opportunities. And I, I think there's opportunities in a couple of things. I think, I think COVID-19 has alerted all of us, Christian and non-Christian, that we don't control our lives. And particularly for the non-Christians, I think this is going to open up times of uh, receptivity, times of being willing to uh, maybe uh, listen to the gospel. Because usually when there's uh, things that happen like this, pandemic, wars, anything that kind of upsets our normal way of life, it creates an openness of people to hear the gospel and to hear about Jesus Christ. And I think there is an openness. I think there will be an openness probably maybe for three to six months after this is really concluded. But I think it's a window that's open for a time and then it will shut. When people kind of get back and it's been six months to a year and they're back to work and life is back to the same, slowly, you know, people kind of forget about the trauma that they're facing. But I think uh, if we can help our people begin to share the gospel, talk to their friends and families and neighbors and co-workers in, in good ways, nice ways, normal conversation uh, about spiritual things. I do think people are going to be open to a conversation about spiritual life and the direction of their lives. So I, I think there's an opportunity there that's coming. And it may be there now, actually, uh, with many, many families and, and friendship connections, you know, good conversation. We saw that happen, uh, Dr. McIntosh, when uh, on 9 11 and the terrorist attack yes. in New York. All of a sudden, uh, the media is blitzing pictures of everybody praying. Uh, right. I mean, from the White House down to, to you know, just the commoner in the street, everybody is kneeling on the steps of buildings and capitals and city halls in the streets. Everybody's praying. Uh, you know, that's, that's something that, uh, that God can be in the midst of the tragedy. Right. You know, we're not going to take time to express, uh, you know, explain who's in charge of the tragedy. Uh, that's yeah. another another uh, sermon in another day, but uh, God certainly takes advantage of the issues of life and uh, certainly right. the issues in our world. Right. Yeah, I used to have a uh, a good friend who was a, a strong evangelist, and he would always tell me he would say, "Gary, just make friends with people," and he says, "Wait for something to happen in their lives like this," you know. He says, just be their friend and wait till uh, something happens uh, of a tragic nature in their life. And he says, then you'll be the one they want to talk to. <laughs> and I, and I think that's, you know, we, we don't need to force our faith on people, but just in normal life and conversation, just let people know that, you know, we're believers and we're trusting in God. And in the normal conversation, questions will come up because uh, people who don't have faith in God, uh, you know, they're worried, you know, what's going to happen and where do I turn? Uh, we're the people that they'll turn to because we have, uh, you know, obviously some sort of faith uh, and uh, they'll want to know, you know, particularly what it is. You know, another thing, though, I think that I just want to emphasize with your pastors and leaders of the churches, now's the opportunity to really think through your church ministry. Uh, what uh, for instance, what would you like to never start again? You know, uh, pastors always sometimes say, well, there's a particular program. I'd just like to cancel that program, but I can't do it um, because maybe there's people in the church who love that particular program and I can't, you know, I can't use the uh, the political capital, I guess, to to cancel that ministry. Well, now you have an opportunity, maybe, just don't start that ministry again when you come back, you know? Or ask the question, what ministries would I like to start? Maybe I couldn't start before, but now when we come back afresh, maybe I could start a brand new ministry um, and the church would be more willing to let me do it, you know? Anytime there's a major event like this in the life of the, an organization, it opens up the possibility of canceling old things and starting new things. And so I, I, we don't want to lose this opportunity because the, the larger event, the larger struggle kind of over, uh, covers over 
small changes we can make in the church. And so I've been suggesting the churches and pastors really think this through. Uh, everybody's going to expect things to be a bit different when we come back. And so let's take advantage of this, cancel some things, start some new things, you know, take advantage of this opportunity to create change in the church. Now, now don't be stupid, you know, don't get yourself fired. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, don't waste this opportunity to make some corrections, make some changes, make some adjustments. Uh, uh, you know, maybe adjustments in time of the worship service or the style of worship. And our people will really let us do this because they know things have changed and things won't be quite the same. And uh, we can kind of blame COVID, you know, we can say, well, you know, that program was kind of on its last legs. And, you know, I think it's best we just don't restart that, you know, and, and they'll let us get away with it from a practical standpoint because they understand things have changed. You know, one of the ministries too, we may have made a lot of new contacts through our online services, a lot of new people who have been watching our services. Some of them will be coming eventually to the physical worship service. Uh, we really need to think through our whole visitor welcome and follow up procedure. You know, we need to be prepared that very first Sunday back, we need to have our ducks in order on the welcoming. And so I, I think right now, uh, a lot of pastors need to be connecting with their worship team through some Zoom conversations or phone conversations or whatever, and really rethinking what can we do to really up our game, so to speak, uh, with the welcoming and the follow-up. If somebody's been, if somebody found us online and then they come, they're only going to come once. And if it's a bad experience, they're not going to come back. We can't wait for six weeks after we get back to kind of reinstitute our welcoming. We need to have that welcoming system up and running the very first Sunday back. Okay. Uh, we are All still right. into a modified phase two, but I'm sure there are pastors watching from other states uh, where some are not even back in their buildings. Some are having multiple services so they can uh, social distance. Uh, our online presence, uh, presence is larger. Many of the pastors have right now in their attendance, they're at between 50 and 70% uh, back, uh, their membership back in attendance. Okay. Uh, so, so what does church growth, Gary, what does church growth look like now? How do we approach this? Now, when you talk about, there's so many items, you know, in the old days, uh, uh, just last year, uh, you know, <laughs> we, you, information gathering was paramount. I mean, we gathered all that information, you know, we needed that information to help us in church growth. We use, we plugged them into formulas, uh, you know, attendance averages and guests uh, in per service and numbers of volunteers will tell you how healthy you are. You know, all of these things now, how do you measure these things when you have part of your congregation online and part of your congregation on site and all of your volunteers are not back and uh, it, it's share with us some 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 thoughts that you have on this uh in the larger picture we're going to be a hybrid church from now on if a church has started an online presence which almost every church has i don't think they should ever give that up when we go back and we start meeting in person we we definitely want to keep offering the online church service just look at that as a another service. I know some churches have two worship services Sunday morning. Some might have three. You know, some churches have more. But I, I think you look at the online church as, a, as another alternate service. Every pastor should see themselves as a hybrid church. We're going to be in person, but we're also going to have the online church forever. We're not going to ever stop doing online church. Now, um, Having said that, I think uh, we, we, in terms of measurements, like you're talking about, we still measure the old measurements. I think there's still going to be some valid points there. But when it comes to online, we're going to have to measure some different things. So, for instance, I think the average person who is online, uh, I've been hearing, is about three minutes. Well, we wouldn't count a person who stepped into our physical service for three minutes and stepped out, we wouldn't certainly wouldn't count them as a, an attender. 
That's almost like counting a person who drives by in a car. What I'm hearing that most churches are doing is um, with their online uh, services, they're able to track how long people stay online. They want people to be online at least 10 to 20 minutes to be counted as an actual church attender online. So it depends a little bit on the platform you're, you're using. And I think each church is going to have to find some tech people to help them. And then there's also ways to uh, gather information. Who is online? Who's watching? The, the builder generation or the boomer generation or the Gen Xers or the, the millennial generation? Um, I'm, I'm not smart enough to know all that technology, but there are people in our churches who can help us with this. But I think the bigger picture uh, is that we just won't, don't want people watching us online. And so we have to move from just people watching to what is being called engagement. How do we engage the person who's online so that they're just part, that they're participating with us? And that's the bigger question. The way a lot of churches are doing this, and I think this has implications for the future, uh, is they're actually hiring an online pastor. They are responsible for overseeing that congregation. So it's, it's like in the physical uh, churches, you might have a worship service at your, your normal church facility, and then you have what's called a multi-site, where maybe you go 10 minutes over in town and rent another building, and you have a church service over there. Well, normally you'll have a pastor over at that other site who is there for pastoral care, organizing small groups for the people over in that other site, is there kind of overseeing the, the music and the service over at that other site. If we have an online congregation, we need to have an online pastor, probably somebody who has uh, got some expertise with technology, but then it's gonna be their responsibility to build a network of small groups online for the people who are watching online. And uh, they're going to be the ones who maybe connect through email or through uh, maybe a text message uh, with the online people. And they'll be the people who counsel and uh, connect with those people somehow or other. So uh, I think if a church can afford the resources to do this and they have a big enough online community, they actually need to have a dedicated pastor or um, maybe uh, at least a half-time pastor who would oversee that online because it's going to be difficult for a pastor like yourself, Daryl, to manage the existing church, the physical church, and do the online stuff. Uh, some smaller churches, I think they may have uh, lay people in the church who have technology ability. Right, that's what we maybe, do. Yeah. Maybe volunteer as an online pastor, and, and they would take care of that online congregation. Uh, but I think if a church has the resources, they can hire somebody to do that. And then what they would do is build these engagement uh, connections. So, for instance, if you were preaching on Sunday morning, the online pastor might be in another room on a computer and they have a chat ability. And so people who are watching online could ask questions by chat. And then while you're in the auditorium preaching, they're sitting in another room answering them on the computer. Uh, so they're conversing with people through the chat. Good. Uh, we had so many guests that were watching online that uh, we, we have assigned a moderator. And that moderator's on that uh, service. It's mainly Facebook where there could be interaction and they're on that service and they're asking questions. So there's, you know, they are offering, we even have a link that says you can click on this link and fill out one of our connect cards to so right. let us know a little bit more about you. And literally a link comes up on their device, whether it's their phone or computer, and they can fill it out right there sitting in their living room or car or wherever they are. It's amazing. Right. And yeah. uh, we also, toward the end of the service, uh, you know, the, they will post all the scriptures as I'm preaching and, and at the end of the service, they will say, if you would like to be baptized or, you know, they engage with these people. That's right. It was incredible. I remember uh, come to my desk uh, at the beginning of one week and there were four guest cards 
printed out from the service that Sunday online for people that said, I would like to be a member of your church. Right. Uh, right. And they consider this engagement as legitimate. And, and, you know, we need to start seeing it the same way. And we have to have this engagement. Churches are actually finding that they can build community with online small groups. And so I think that um, it goes beyond just that. I think what we're talking about now with these text messages and email messages and chats, uh, this is the beginning. But I think then it has to go beyond that. And this is where like a, uh, an online pastor is uh, more involved than say just a moderator. So what happens the next week or two after the service is over you know, somebody has to take responsibility to connect with those people and say, would you like to participate in an online small group? You know, we're going to have a, if you'd like to test it out, we're going to do this on Thursday night at seven o'clock. Here's the Zoom link, join us, you know, and so maybe Very three good. or four people or five or 10 people come in and, and the online pastor's there to greet them and talk to them and and then maybe set up another person. And this is where volunteers come in because some of the volunteers can church could volunteer to lead an online small group. And uh, so each week they meet with people, they study the Bible or study the pastor's sermon, or they, um, you know, have some prayer time and, uh, you know, some interaction. And they do this on a regular basis, just like any small group would be meeting in somebody's home or something, but they do it online. So I think this is a, uh, you know, something we're really going to have to work through. And uh, usually there just has to be somebody who makes this their ministry. I think we're seeing the emergence of a new staffing uh, position, certainly online pastor, but I think the tech area is going to increasingly be important. You know, to have the tech people in our church who can make sure that uh, everything works properly, that we have the right cameras, the right sound equipment. Uh, you can pay for this and have it done outside the church, but I think increasingly we're gonna have our own tech departments in the church. And what I noticed, in, and this happened of course back in uh, March and April, churches just wanted to get online. <clears throat> so they're using Apple phones and they're using any kind of equipment that they can find, any camera, <laughs> you know. And if you watch some of those services like I have, some of them weren't, just weren't that good, you know, <laughs> because the equipment wasn't good, the technology wasn't good. And I think we're seeing the importance of investing money for future ministry in better technology, better cameras, better sound equipment, better lighting, maybe even developing a sound studio, a recording studio in the church building where we can pre-record uh, messages and have a little more control for post-editing purposes and things like that. So that when we send the service out, it's a better product. I hate to use that word product because I know it sounds too much like a business and the church is really not a business, but when every church in America is online now, our church service needs to look a little better. Uh, you know, one of the studies that I, I read over these, this pandemic uh, in last year was that more unchurched people are watching online services than in the history of the church. I mean, of course, yeah. we've only had this technology, you know, for a number of years, but, uh, but it's astounding to know that our world's looking in, looking for answers, uh, the unchurched, and that, that's, a, that's why I agree the, the, what a powerful point you made. We need to get busy now in this moment. You, even though it's uncomfortable for you, even though you know many of the pastors told me they had so much difficulty looking at a, a little camera and trying to reproduce that feeling of preaching or teaching, and there's no one in front of them. And, but you know what? Uh, the technology is, is, it may be different, but it's allowing us such a, a an, an avenue into homes and places we would never otherwise be able to go. I think right. God's opening up some big doors for the church. We may be at a place where uh, a pastor has to preach the same sermon, but in two different ways. 
when we preach to a live audience and we're standing up there and we're moving around and we're praising God and uh, we can see their body language and, and they're saying amen and hallelujah, uh, we play off of that as pastors. It, uh, there's an emotional rhythm uh, that develops you know, with the congregation and that, that empowers them and empowers us. And, and as you say, when you're trying to preach like that to a screen, to a computer, yeah <laughs> it's it's just so different you can't see anybody you can't see their body language you can't hear them saying amen or or preach it or anything just to film the pastor preaching from the pulpit sometimes doesn't communicate across the um the the uh the, the camera the way they would to a congregation of 100 or 500 I'm expecting them to talk to me. This is a pers very personal medium. It's like you and I right now talking to each other. We're not preaching to each other. We're just talking. So I, I think that um, maybe, you know, a pastor is going to have to pre-record a message where it's more personable, just me and you, and, and I'm in your home. Uh, and uh, But then when I preach at church, I preach in a normal uh, preaching style, whatever that is, to that particular church. And we do need to do post-production editing and all that, but uh, I would caution pastors, don't make it too slick. Particularly the younger generations want pastors that are authentic. Authenticity is just be yourself. If you, if you say something wrong, it's okay. Don't go back and edit it out and redo it. That's okay. You know, just be honest, be yourself. You know, we want it to be a, a good production, a good uh, production value, so to speak, uh, uh, particularly with sound. You know, we want them to be able to hear us. We want the sound to sync with our lips. <laughs> you know, we want those things to be there. Right. But just be yourself, Pastor, when you're online. Uh, uh, but talk more as though you're talking to one person versus 800 people. Uh, and I think it will come across the screen much better. Well, I know that you have some tremendous books that are out. You know, we have been changed by some of your books the, in our thinking on church growth, like uh, your book, uh, What Every Pastor Should Know, uh, the book One Size Doesn't Fit All, these, these fabulous books that are so nuts and bolts, uh, ground level practical that we can understand and plug our, our churches into those books and figure out direction on breaking barriers. Uh, you have a new book coming out. Uh, we look forward to that later on in the year. Tell me that you are putting together some thoughts about what we are talking about, <laughs> because there needs to be certainly something. Tom Rainer just put out something. Uh, I bought his book quickly. It was, uh, I think, post-pandemic church or something. And these these are times where we really do need some instruction. And there's, there's uh, you men who are very, uh, you ladies as well, who are gifted in writing and, and, and giving information. Certainly we need that in this era. Yeah. Well, I, I'm hoping to do at least a, a one or two articles. Uh, uh, my wife said, are you going to write a book on the, the uh, post-pandemic church? And I said, well, uh, there's already books published. <laughs> I, I, I got on that one too late, you know, so I don't know if I'll write a book about it. I'll probably write a few practical articles. Tell us about your book that's coming out this year. Sure. It, it's called The uh, Ten Key Roles of a Pastor. And uh, basically what I did is I did a survey of pastors uh, to see where they actually spend their time. What do pastors do all week? A lot of lay people think we only work one day a week, but we know better. <laughs> I did a survey and it was pre-COVID. And, uh, and doesn't include, you know, the current reality. I basically found that pastors spend their time in about 10 different areas. You know, uh, they, they spend a lot of time communicating, preaching, and preparing to communicate and preach. Uh, they spend time uh, leading and managing the church. They spend time in pastoral care. Uh, some pastors spend time you know, involved in the community, like maybe with a, a Qantas club or something of that nature at the mayor's office or volunteering for the fire department as a chaplain, uh, things of that nature. So 
basically I decided that to put these into 10 categories, I call them hats, 10 hats of a pastor. Uh, basically, I just kind of list them from where pastors put most of their time to where they put the least of their time. Then in the book, I tend to lean towards practicality, I give a lot of practical tips on how pastors can wear that particular hat uh, better. Uh, so just as a little teaser, I'll, I'll tell the uh, listeners that the, this will not be a surprise, uh, but pastors put most of their time in to prepare for preaching and, and, and communicating in other ways too. Uh, communication is probably our number one thing we do as pastors. Uh, most of us, or most people would see that primarily on Sunday uh, as we preach. Uh, but the average pastor in a growing church uh, puts in about 10 to 15 hours a week uh, in preparing for their sermon. So that's about a day and a half of time. And nobody and, wants to be an average pastor, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, this is the growing church. Yeah. Here's, here's the kicker on this. Pastors of declining churches only put in about five hours a week on wow. their sermon. Wow. So uh, I think pastors and growing churches put in about three times as much time preparing for their sermon than pastors are declining. So what I do is I compare what do pastors of growing churches, where do they put their time versus pastors who are in declining churches, where do they put their time? Of course, my hope is that pastors who are in churches that are declining can maybe adjust their schedules to look more like a pastor of a growing church. and. Uh, it's no guarantee their church will grow, but maybe we can learn from what pastors and growing churches, where do they prioritize their time versus well, you, where the pastors in non-growing churches prioritize their time. Well, of course, we've had you here at the Pentecostals of Lafayette and uh, in 2011, and we had been on a long journey three years without growth. Uh, we thought we were doing everything right and everything we knew to do, we were doing it. And after you came to give us some practical advice on some, just some tweaking of some programs and things, in those next three years, our church nearly doubled. And so we understand that they're, they're, we can't make the church grow, but you've taught us, and this is the revelation you gave Karen and I to get on this uh, church growth wagon, and that is that you can position your church to grow and uh, it has a better chance at that time then to see the growth God means for it. That's right. Yeah, I like to say we, we can't make the church grow. God, God grows the church, but we can create an environment where there's a greater possibility it can grow, you know, so we can, we can up the potential uh, by good. what we do. So, so hopefully this book will be helpful to pastors, you know, to help them reassess where they invest their time because we all have the same amount of time. Every pastor has the same amount of time. Uh, you know, you can't create time at all. It's just there. Uh, but some pastors use their time more wisely uh, than other pastors. And so that's my intent with the book that maybe I can help pastors rethink where they invest their time and, and maybe adjust it to where they'd be more fruitful uh, with their with the results of their time. Dr. McIntosh, with all the changes and the constant new decisions that leaders, especially pastors, have had to make over the past year, uh, there's been great pressure on their shoulders and probably hasn't been this level of pressure in this way uh, that they've ever faced possibly. Congregations are not fully back, and in many cases, finances have dropped. Not all cases, but we are seeing some hardships. These times have placed a different weight on pastors. What are pastors feeling emotionally and spiritually? And Dr. McIntosh, what, what do you feel they can do during this time? The number one thing the pastors are feeling is tired. They're tired. Most pastors tell me they're actually working more now than they were pre. Uh, COVID. It seems like to deliver a sermon online, for instance, is harder. It, it seems like it's more emotional. And I think some of it goes back to what we were talking about before. When, when you're preaching in person, you, you kind of play off the, the emotions and the feedback from the congregation. And now they're not getting that feedback 
And so they're preaching, but they don't know what's happening out there. And, and so it's like they're, they're trying harder. Uh, I know for myself, I've done a lot of uh, online interviews and I find myself raising my voice. And uh, my wife sometimes will be in the room and she'll say, talk softer, talk softer. And I've been thinking about that. Why do I raise my voice? Well, I think I have to scream in order for that person on the other side of the screen to hear me. Well, I don't have to, but you know, I'm, I'm working harder when I'm online than I am when I'm in person. And I think that's happening with pastors. Um, they're trying to call everybody in their church. Maybe they wouldn't be doing that. Uh, you know, they see people at church and, and, and be able to hug people and, you know, talk to people. But now they're trying to call everybody and that, that's extra energy, extra time. Um, just the pressure of dealing with technology. Some pastors just aren't techie people. Uh, they're relational people, but they, this tech stuff just drives them nuts and, and yet they have to do it. And, and that emotionally drains them. Um, pastors are tired, they're lonely. Uh, because they haven't been able to gather with people and they they feel this extreme kind of loneliness. The baby boomers and the uh, the builders, which would be our older pastors today, they thrive off of the personal relationships, being together, being with people. The Gen Xers and the uh, millennials, for sure, uh, they they are they're okay being online, you know, because they're online a lot anyway, and. And they build relationships and they connect online. So it's somewhat generational, I think. Uh, younger pastors are probably doing okay. Older pastors, grieving, lonely, hurting, discouraged. I think uh, perhaps another word I hear all the time is I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed yeah. uh, with everything I got to do, you know. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's the words I hear all the time. So what can they do? What can they do? I would say to pastors, give yourself permission to rest. Give yourself permission sure. to rest. Take a nap. If you need a nap, take a nap in the afternoon. Don't feel guilty about it. You got to take care of yourself. You're, you're the shepherd God's put in that particular church. And if you're not healthy, it's going to be hard for the congregation to be healthy. And so you've got to, without guilt, take care of yourself uh, spiritually physically emotionally uh, but a lot of this is just getting good rest sleep uh, take that nap in the afternoon uh, if you need to talk to somebody talk to somebody you know I'm finding that quite a few pastors are uh, doing zoom small groups with other pastors I've got a friend of mine he's in Colorado uh, he runs a ministry called Fresh Start, and he meets every week with five or six pastors online. And, you know, call him a coach if you want, but, you know, they're just meeting together. It's an opportunity for four or five pastors to talk to each other. They can grieve together. They can express their frustrations together. They pray together. Uh, don't just be alone out there, pastor. You know, don't, don't just be alone. You can only talk to your spouse so long. And pretty soon your spouse doesn't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> Very good advice. You know, I think rest, uh, getting connected maybe with some other pastors. You know, I would even offer this. If some pastors feel like they, they want to have somebody to talk to, I'd be happy to set up myself maybe a, a, a Zoom weekly or bi-weekly uh, Zoom gathering with four or five pastors if they just need somebody to talk to. I'm sure there's other pastors in your district and area that uh, could be a host, maybe a, a small group just for pastors, uh, confidential, just, you know, sharing together and praying together uh, so that there's some support. Enjoy your family. Do some family things. Uh, if you put off doing things with a family, do them. As much as your state, every state's different and every county sometimes within the state's different. Whatever you're allowed to do, a lot of times pastors are so overworked with pastoral ministry, they don't do things with their family or they neglect their family. Well, now's the time, put your family up there higher in your uh, uh, to-do list, you know, and, and do things with them. Uh, 
One other thing I would mention is this is a good time for pastors to retool. Um, at our university, uh, we're finding a phenomenon. The, the college kids, the registration of college students is going down uh, for a number of reasons. But the registration in the grad schools, the master's degrees, and the doctoral degree programs is going up. Hmm. And I'm finding that that's true even in the secular community that uh, people who are already in careers are using this opportunity to go back to school to maybe get another degree or get further training or get a new certification. Uh, it's an opportunity to kind of get a, uh, some new skills that will help you when we're back. And so a lot of mid-career people are going back to school right now. And, and in doing that, it energizes them. Uh, rather than sitting at home, being lonely, discouraged, worried, enroll in an online class somewhere at a, a university, college, seminary, something. You know, if you don't know much about finances, maybe you take a class at a school on finances or, uh, you know, there might be a, a class you could take online on church growth or, or missional church or church health or something, you know, church revitalization. Uh, but just doing that, engaging, you know, in, in continuing, continual learning, helps revive the spirit, so to speak. And of course, prayer. I think, uh, you know, I don't have to tell you this, you know, your churches are known for prayer, but uh, I know pastors sometimes get so busy, they don't pray, particularly in America. Certainly. You know, because America is a, a go, 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 do, do, do culture. And we don't take time to, to rest and to pray and to give ourselves that kind of spiritual space. And I think now's the time we can do that, to spend some, some time each day meditating on God's word and, and thinking and praying. And I know some pastors do it, but I, know also, I also am close enough to know pastors sometimes get so busy they don't do it. Well, and discouragement has uh, many uh, symptoms. Uh, you know, it, it, discouragement, uh, we don't like to use the word depression. Uh, but yep. we're hearing that word more and more yes. uh, from the congregation and now pastors that are opening up, pastors' wives, or some places, pastors' husbands, you know, uh, if we have a, a, a female pastor. But um, discouragement, those things can make you go into a shell, make you think that you cannot, as a pastor, expose, open your heart and share those intimate feelings because it would make you seem like you had a weakness. Right. Um, but uh, that would be to our detriment if we were to hold those things in. What a fabulous concept and idea, Dr. McIntosh, to, to get a, a Zoom meeting with, with four or five, six pastors and to just be able to share, to be able to talk about the church, the condition, but mainly to be able to say, how are you? Uh, what are you feeling right now? You know, what are you and your family doing together? What are your plans, you know, to get this conversation going? What a fabulous idea. Discouragement, uh, depression is a challenge, uh, even for Christians. Um, you know, we're still human beings. And, um, and, you know, we face these things just like anybody does. There was a time in my life, this goes back about 30 years ago, you know, I went and, to a Christian counselor because I was between, to, between ministries, very discouraged, uh, difficult time in my life. And uh, uh, I actually obtained the services of a Christian counselor. I met with uh, this man uh, every week for a year. I look back on that and, uh, you know, that, that Christian counselor was such a ministry to me. Uh, gave him gave me somebody to talk to and share my heart with and uh um i think that in a lot of ways he saved my ministry and he saved my ministry i was about 39 years old uh, so it's been quite a few years now but uh you know i would encourage your pastors don't feel guilty if you need help go get it <laughs> you know go get it. it may just be conversation with a friend or with a group of pastors but if you need you know regular professional help get it you know, there are Christian people out there who are gifted to help us think through, you know, issues like this. Right. Very good. And I, I, I pray that we can help some of these pastors, leaders that are feeling these 
these uh, great pressures of the, uh, you know, we'll just say what it is. These are end time uh, results of yes. our world. That's that, you know, we're not the, the, I hope we're not seeming like we're the bringers of bad news or the bearers of bad news, but the Bible doesn't uh, give us great news about the condition of the world in the last days, but it does give us great news about the condition of the church in these last days. And we know that the church is going to be in the same world, obviously, and hit by many of the same issues, but God is going to strengthen his people and God is going to be the help in these times. And many times, uh, he will work through each of us to help each other. And so we're thankful for that great advice. Dr. McIntosh, thank you for a tremendous insight and valuable direction this evening. I, I think this would be a good place before we make our final comments here. Just, uh, I would like to pray for those that are watching, uh, could be pastors, church leaders. Uh, this would be a wonderful time to do that. Lord, by the power and the authority of your name, we're so thankful today this evening for these wonderful leaders, leaders in your kingdom, pastors, church leaders, directors. We're asking you, Lord, to keep your hands upon each one of them. We're asking your will to be done in their lives. Give them the strength they need and the wisdom they need in these times that we're facing. God, we know that the inward battle is always greater than the outward battle, and we're praying right now in Jesus' name, for those that are facing these inward issues, Lord, that they will place them in your hands. Your word tells us to cast our cares on you. And so we do that this evening. We cast our cares on you. You care for us. You love us. And Lord, it is your will that we, Paul told the church, it is God's will that you prosper. That's my prayer. Prosper in your faith. Prosper in your finances. Prosper in your health and prosper in church growth. We're believing these things are your will, Lord, and we trust your will in our lives. We pray protection. We pray the, uh, the blessings of your hand upon each one of these churches and their leaders. And Lord, we thank you for what you're accomplishing through us, and we give you the glory for the future is great ahead of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. To Amen. Dr. McIntosh, one more time, thank you so much for joining us what valuable direction you've you've uh, given us this evening and to our audience tonight on behalf of the louisiana north american missions team uh and i want to thank you for joining us our prayers that again god would bless you and walk you through these times he is with you he is with us and uh, may the power of the plan of god unfold in your life your family your ministry your church we believe these things, and we are going to place our great faith in him because these things are in his hands. May God bless you richly is our prayer. Hello, Louisiana. I am Ryan Allman with the Louisiana North American Missions Team, and I'm excited to tell you about an incredible program, Church in a Day. Church in a Day takes a church from a storefront to a brand new service-ready building in just 24 hours. Since the inception of Church in a Day, 142 church buildings have been built across the U.S. and Canada. These new church buildings are constructed by hundreds of volunteers who donate their time and efforts free of charge for the kingdom of God. While the churches each purchase their own property, the only cost of the actual building to the congregation is an interest-free loan of $50,000 which is used for materials. At the completion of the project, a mere 24 hours after our volunteers arrive on site, the congregation has a new 2,900 square foot building, complete with classrooms, restrooms, sound systems, baptistry, seating, landscaping, and a sanctuary which seats about 130 people, all appraised at up to $400,000. Can you imagine what a blessing this is to a young church? This project propels them years into the future by giving them their own modern facilities. A church in a day building is an incredible witness to the community in which it is built, often attracting new people immediately with the excitement and media attention it brings to the area. 
Louisiana has completed four church in a day projects with our fifth brand new building planned to be built in Hesmer, Louisiana, May 14th and 15th of this year for a wonderful new congregation pastored by Jared and Leslie Rains. The church family in Hesmer has purchased their property, begun the initial preparations, and are highly anticipating the day they get to see their building come to life. This dream come true is possible because of the generous Christmas for Christ offerings given by the wonderful congregations around our state. Now for another very exciting announcement. You can be a part of this miracle in motion. You can be a part by helping other volunteers construct a church building from just a concrete slab to a fully functioning church facility in just 24 hours. We're in need of uh, and welcome skilled and unskilled laborers, cooks, cleanup volunteers, and more. If you would like to volunteer for our HESMA project, please register on our district website at www.ladishupc.com and go onto the North American Missions page. We are looking forward to gathering together with you to bring the town of Hesmer, Louisiana, a brand new place of life and hope in just a few months. We hope to see you there. Hello everyone. My name is Dwayne Parker, Secretary of the North American Missions Team. I would like to share with you how you can help North American missionaries reach their cities and communities this year. Christmas for Christ is a giving program that began in 1966 and has been the primary way the UPCI has supported church planners ever since. Over the past 54 years, the Pentecostals of Louisiana have given nearly $10 million to Christmas for Christ. In just the last 13 years, Louisiana and our Louisiana North American missionaries have planted 25 new churches and 35 daughter churches. This incredible kingdom work here in Louisiana has resulted in hundreds if not thousands of men and women and children hearing the gospel, being baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. This is cause to celebrate. Each year, the offering you faithfully give to Christmas for Christ supports these missionaries with financial resources they would not otherwise have. These resources help our Louisiana church planners lease buildings, purchase media sound equipment, chairs, furnishings, church vans, fund renovation projects, citywide outreaches, annual revival services, and so much more. In other words, your CFC offering plants seeds of potential changed eternities for people across the state. With your help, Christmas for Christ has built four brand new churches for our Louisiana missionaries through our Church in a Day projects. And we're thrilled to tell you that our fifth will be built this May in Hesmer, Louisiana. It's not too late to give your best gift to Jesus for 2020. While many of our churches have already sent their 2020 CFC offerings in, if you have not, there's still time. These offerings are due in the Louisiana District Office on Monday, February 8th. Thank you for linking arms with the Louisiana North American Missions Team. It is our honor to have Reverend Kenneth Stewart minister to us this evening as we close out Advance 2021. Brother Stewart currently serves the UPCI as the Director of Promotions for North American Missions. Prior to that, he and his wife Althea founded Tabernacle of Hope in downtown Tampa, Florida in 2006. Brother Stewart also previously served the Florida District as the North American Missions Director for eight years, and before that, Secretary for three years. He served on the UPCI General Board for five years as Building the Bridge Director, as well as on the Executive Board as Regional Executive Presbyter of the Southeast. Brother Kenneth has a bachelor's degree in missions from Christian Life College in Stockton, California. Kenneth Stewart is a friend to the Louisiana District in advance. He's not only an anointed preacher, but a successful church planter and a seasoned pastor. I know that we will all benefit from his ministry this evening. Brother Stewart, welcome to Louisiana. Welcome back to the Advance Conference. It's an honor to be here with you tonight at Advance Church Growth Strategies. Anytime I can be with my friend Daryl Weber, it's an honor. He is the North American Missions Director that other directors want to grow up to be. He's an amazing director leading a district as crucial as Louisiana and setting the way for all of us with church planting and Christmas for Christ fundraise, everything that he does. 
and indeed this seminar is sponsored by the great church he's built here in Lafayette, the Pentecostals of Lafayette, and we appreciate that, and also the Louisiana Name Department. We appreciate their sponsorship of this conference. But we're going to look into the word of the Lord tonight. I believe there's some church planners that are going to listen to us, that are going to watch us, some pastors and some pastor's wives that are coming to hear a word from God in such a difficult time our country is going through. So turn with me right now into the book of 2 Kings chapter 4. We're going to read from verse 8 to 11 in 2 Kings chapter 4. And the Bible says, And it fell on the day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passes by us continually. And let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall. And let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. And it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on the day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And for a few moments this evening, I'm going to preach on the topic of if you build it, he will come. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come to you. We thank you, Lord, for this chance to gather together at this great conference. Those that will be watching this with us online, bless them right now. Every situation, every heartache, every pain they're going through, let us minister to them tonight by your power, by your grace. We want to receive from you in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. You know, my job at North American Missions, Director of Promotion, I spend a lot of time on the road. After a while, all the airports and all the hotels begin to look the same. I forget what city that I'm in even sometimes. But as I travel the country, I notice a strange thing. So I drive down various interstates. It all begins to look the same after a while. You got the next exit at Home Depot, Bank of America, you know, Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, housing development, malls everywhere. And sometimes you drive through an area and look like in the middle of nowhere they're putting in the bank and a grocery store. And you say, why would they put this in the middle of nowhere? You come back just a few months later and you got thousands of homes and schools built. There's an old saying in development that if you build it, they will come. But I did not come to speak to you about development, housing developments, and buildings of buildings. I came to speak to you about building a place for God. Because one thing I have learned, if you build it, God will show up. Because God created man for fellowship. And because God created man for fellowship, God still desires to have that fellowship with man. And because God desires to have that fellowship with man, uh, when man creates that room, uh, when man creates that place, uh, when man creates that opportunity for God to move in and God just moves in. Uh, I'm delighted tonight to speak to some of my heroes uh, that are church planners that go to various cities and towns across America and go into a school or to a community center, to a living room and decide to build a church for the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, and I come to tell you, once you decide to build a place for God, that God is going to show up and that is guaranteed. He's just looking for a place to land and a place to lie and a place to be. Second Kings chapter 8, there's a woman. The Bible calls her a great woman, which means she was a woman of means, woman of renown, a woman that was known. But she noticed something that the man of God would pass by that road in front of her house. And the Bible says that as she saw the man of God passing by, she began to constrain him, to beg him when he saw him passing by to come and eat bread in her house with her and her husband and break bread together. And bread always signifies the word of God. And if you're going to build a, a place for God, it must be built upon the word of God. Uh, you must be a place where you can break bread. Uh, amen. I thank God that we're in the apostolic church that believes in following the word of God, uh, believes in preaching the word of God, uh, believes in living the word of God, uh, because God cannot show up if it's not a place where bread is being broken. Uh, so if you want to build a place for God in your life, uh, build a place for God in your school, uh, build a place for God in your neighborhood, uh, build a place for God in your job, begin to break some bread there. Uh, begin to spend some time in the word uh, because the first thing you must do is break bread uh, before God can show up. But after she began to break bread, uh, 
something began to happen to her. And she told her husband, uh, we need to build a room for the man of God. Uh, Because the more time you spend in breaking bread, uh, you begin to desire that deeper relationship with God. Uh, That casual passing by experience uh, once or twice a week uh, is not going to work anymore. Uh, And you're going to say, I want to build a room. Uh, I've got to build a place. Uh, I've got to spend some time with God. Uh, People don't understand sometimes why we go to church so much, uh, why we volunteer so much time, why we put so much into the house of God, because we begin to break bread. And the more we break bread, the more bread we desire to break, the more time we want to spend with God. You see, as I come to ask you a question tonight, uh, is there room in your life for God? Uh, Sometimes in the midst of life's busyness and getting the kids around a soccer practice and running here and there with our jobs and our careers and so much, uh, do you have room in your life for God? And the one thing I've become convinced in these last days that the enemy has found out it's easier to keep apostolics busy, so busy they have no time to make room for the things of God than it is to make them sin. The devil doesn't care what stops you from doing the will of God. The devil doesn't care what stops you from doing the work of God. The devil don't care what distracts you from reaching your potential with God. If it's sin or just busyness, and we run and we run and we go and we go, it's like the Bible talks about putting your money into a bag with holes in it. Uh, we put our time into a bag with holes in it, and we're so busy. And what's really getting done? Do you have room in your life for God? God's not trying to fit in between your schedule, fit into your crowded life. Uh, he wants you to build a room for him in your life. I've often wondered about this woman. The Bible says that she was barren. And in those days, not understanding like we do today with modern medicine, a woman was barren they assumed that she was cursed of God. I've often wondered if she was not barren, if she had a house full of children, a house full of grandchildren, would she have noticed the man that got walking by every day? Would she have said, let's build a room for God? But you know, she was so busy building a nursery and building a playroom, she might not even have noticed a man of God going by. And sometimes uh, it's your barrenness. Sometimes it's your lack Sometimes it's your emptiness that finally drives you to a place uh, to build a place for God. I've heard it said that God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. Uh, And sometimes it takes those bearing experiences uh, to get you to a place to where you feel that need to say, I must build uh, a room for God. But once she decided to build it, she had her mind and said, you know what, honey, she told her husband, we build this place. uh, We're going to put it on the wall. In the Bible days, they had a wall around the top of their house, uh, the most visible part of their house, uh, the most vulnerable part of their house, uh, because when someone got into the wall, uh, they could get into your house. Uh, But she said, we're going to build a place for God. It's not going to be in the basement. Uh, It's not going to be in the backyard. Uh, It's going to be on the wall. It's going to be up front. It's going to be visible. Uh, When people say, what are you building? What is that? When they come to my house, I'll say, that's the room I built for God. Uh, And I come to challenge somebody today that when you build that place for God, it must be visible. It must be in the forefront. It must be the first thing people see about you. We live in a very divided world today. And the enemy is trying to bring division into the church. You know how we stop division into the church? Uh, is the first thing people see about you is the room you built for God. Uh, Before they see your political party, uh, before they see your skin color, uh, before they see your socioeconomic status, uh, before they see your job, uh, before they see your career, the first thing they should see is this is a person that has built a room for God. Uh, This is a person that God comes forth in their life uh, and that trumps every other thing we stand for, we get involved with, let people People see that I belong to God. I built a room for God. It's on the wall. It's on the forefront. And that's the first thing you must know about me because Christ promised if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. So build a room and put it on the wall. Because once they built that room for the man of God, he had a place to lay. He had a place to to live. Uh, The Bible lets us know that God will inhabit the praises of his people. You build that room for God. It's a place for God to show up and to stay. Uh, Because once they built that room with the man of God, it immediately changed their relationship. See, because before they built a room, 
He could only come when he was invited. If he was walking by and they were on the front porch and saw him walking by, they would tell him to come in. But guess what? Now he had a key. He had a room. Come in any time. When you build that room for God, God could come in any time. Before, he would only stop by when he saw them outside. Uh, but now they will be surprised sometimes when they came home. Uh, as they came back home and much to their surprise, there will be that familiar chariot uh, that belonged to the man of God. You know, they would say, honey, I did not know the man of God was even coming today. Oh, we were gone. He showed up and he's already here. And when you build a room for God in your deepest and darkest trials, God would already be there. Uh, at two o'clock in the morning and the phone rings, you just got some bad news. You don't have to go looking for God because you built that room for God and God is already there. Uh, you can't wait for God to show up on a Sunday morning. Uh, Sometimes you need God on Tuesday night at two o'clock in the morning. When you build that room for God, God just shows up. And the third thing he did was they built that room. It was a place for God to work from. It became the headquarters for the man of God in that area. You know, when I travel somewhere like Houston uh, and my brother lives there in Houston, you know what I say? I got a place to stay. I can just stay as long as I want. I can come early. I can stay late. I can just drive to where I need to be. I have a place that I could be. And when a man of God came in that area, that became his headquarters. Uh, when you build that room for God in your life, guess what? Uh, on your job, you say, God, this is where you work from, this cubicle right here. In your school, you say, God, from this desk right here in this classroom. In your neighborhood, you say, right here in this apartment, in this home, in this address. This is where you live, God. I built a place for you. This is where you work from. This is your headquarters. You come anytime, say, as long as you want to, because you got a place to work from and you're ready to bless and move and bring revival. That's why. We've got to plant churches. That's why we got to plant daughter work. That's why we need more preaching points. We need places that are built for God that God can work from and reach every community. The scripture lets us know that a man's gift will make room for him. But I believe also you build a room for God, it makes a room for your gifts to operate. You don't got to wait for the pastor to ask you to lead, to teach, lead the choir, take a position. You just work on that room uh, and you make that room for God and God will begin to use you in your ministry and your gifts that he has given you. But you say, preacher, I, I want to build a room for God. I think I built a room for God. How do I know? Let me tell you how we know. Look at the things, the four things this woman put into the room. Uh, if you're going to build a room for God, these four things have got to be in the room. See, the first thing she said to her husband, we build the room first, there's got to be a bed. See, that bed is a place for God to rest and a place for God to live in. You don't really have a place to stay until you have a bed. You know, if I come to your house and you take me to your guest room, you say, Brother Stewart, stay as long as you want. And all that's there is a hardback chair to sit in. I'm going to say, well, I'm not staying all night. I can't sleep inside that chair. It's too hard. It's too straight. Uh, there's no bed here to lay on. Uh, and God is saying, is there a place in your life that I can lay on? Is there a place in your life that I can stay uh, and a place that I can live? Uh, just like the ark in the Holy of Holies. Uh, that was a place that the spirit of God could dwell permanently. And God is looking for a place that built with the bed that says, God, it's not just two hours on Sunday morning. I want you to show up. But here's a bed. Uh, here's a place for you to lay 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You could stay. The second thing she told her husband, let's put in the room, is a table. A table signifies a place for fellowship. It's a place for God to feed you. It's a place for God to speak with you. It's a place for you to listen to God. You know, right after my wife and I got married and had our first child, my wife started asking about something that I found a strange request. She said, what time is going to be dinner time? And I said, what's dinner time? You see, because... Growing up in a family of nine children like I did, we had no set time for dinner. The table wouldn't hold 11 people. So my mom would cook. You'd make a plate when you got hungry. You'd eat with by yourself, eat with four people, eat with five people. I said, maybe on Sundays we never ate together. My wife came from a home where every day her and her siblings and parents sat down at a certain time and ate dinner together. But you know what? That dinner time became your special time. I'd make sure I was home from work in time to sit there with the children and hear about their day and, and find out what's going on in their life. I know today all you do is sit there and be on cell phones doing dinner. Don't even talk to each other. That's a different message. But is there a place in your life for you to sit down and God to talk to you, to be fed and fellowship together, not just to rush through it, 
God doesn't have a top 10 list on your way out the door to say, this is what I need you to fix today. He needs some place in your life where you could sit at a table and be fed and have fellowship. The table of showbread in that tabernacle, in that holy place. Uh, amen. There was a table there. There's a fellowship where the bread is being broken and the word is being shared. The third thing she says, let's put in the room is a stool. You know, the stool to me, that signifies a throne. Is there a place in your life for God to sit and God to tell you what to do? A lot of people come to church and they know what they need God to do. They don't want to hear what God has for them to do. Growing up at home, there was a chair that all nine of us kids knew was dad's chair. And when dad came home, no one sat in that chair but dad. And from that chair, magic happened. The grass got cut. The cars got washed. The rooms got clean. So how did all that happen? Did dad do it? No, dad sat in that chair and didn't lift a finger. But from that chair, there would come the commands of what the children would go to do. And it would happen while dad was in that chair. Is there a place in your life for God to sit and God to tell you what to do? Is there a place in your life where you can listen <coughs> to what the word of God is speaking to you and listen to him? And too many people today don't have a place where they're willing to listen to God. It's not sacrifice if it doesn't hurt. It's not submission if you want to do it anyway. But is there a place for the man of God and God himself to sit in your life and tell you what it is that God should do? Like the altar of incense, a place for God to work, a place in your life for God to tell you what to do. It's got to be a throne. And the fourth thing was, she told her husband, there's got to be a candlestick. Got to be light. And light does two things. Light gives you light and light gives light to others. We are the light of the world. We overcome the devil by the word of our testimony. And let our light so shine. The darker this world gets, the brighter our light should shine. In that holy place, they have the six branch, seven limp limp stand that was the light. And we are supposed to be the light. And when you have a light inside that room, it's a light to light your path, the word of God to lead you, that you may not sin against them. Be a light to others of the miraculous provision of God, even in the midst of a pandemic. God is blessing, God financially blessing, sin and revival. We want to be that light to the world. But in that room you built for God must be a bed for God to lay, must be a table for God to feed and fellowship with you, must be a stool for God to sit and tell you what to do. And you listen to what God says, it must be a candlestick to be a light to the world around us. And God is no respected person. You just build a room with what you have. Uh, amen. Uh, all Jacob had in a moment of despair, amen, was a pile of stones for a pillow. And God showed up. Uh, Abraham built an altar in a moment of sacrifice. And a ram showed up in the thicket. And God showed up. Uh, the first tabernacle was just made of tents uh, that was built for God. That's all they had. Uh, it doesn't matter what material you have. Uh, there's no code enforcement when you build a room for God. If you just build a room for God. God is going to show up. I'm standing here speaking to you today at Tabernacle of Hope in Tampa, Florida. Amen. As you're watching this from Louisiana and this church sits on one of the worst street corners in town. There's prostitution and drugs. And we moved in here first several years ago. There was drive by shootings and stabbings. And we have to come early in the morning to clean up the drug paraphernalia from outside the church and human waste and various things we had to deal with. And people would ask me sometimes and say, how do you feel safe in a place like that? And I said, it's the safest place in town because 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there's a cop in the parking lot. Uh, amen. There's always blue lights here. So I feel safe. But guess what I started to notice as the months went by uh, and as the years went by, uh, the police were here less often. Uh, the drugs were here less often. Uh, amen. The prostitution was happening less often uh, until after a while we didn't see that all anymore. And why is that? Because we decided to build a place for God. It doesn't matter if it's the worst street corner in town. It doesn't matter if it's the best suburb in town. Once you build a place for God and God shows up, great things begin to happen. And that's why I come to tell you today, if you build it, 
The man that got asked her, what do you need from God? Let me tell you something. You build a room for God. You don't have to chase God down to tell God what you want. God shows up and says, uh, what do you want me to do for you today? The spirit itself make intercession for you. You build that room for God. And God says, what can I do for you today? And she said, I am fine. Uh, I don't have need of anything. Uh, but in verse 14, Gehazi said, Elijah, she does not have a child. And you know why she does not have a child? It's because her husband is old. The reason people called her cursed, uh, the reason people called her barren was not even her fault. Uh, it was because her husband was old. Uh, but when you build a room for God, it don't matter how you got in that predicament. It don't matter whose fault it is. Uh, it doesn't matter where you're from or what was done to you. You build a room for God and God can begin to do some great things in your life. The man of God promised her a child, and she thought it was a lie. Don't lie to me, man of God. She lost all hope to ever have a child, but you build that room for God, and God shows up. He's faithful. He'll answer your prayers. Promises come true. Dreams you gave up on many years ago. Just build a room for God. Let God show up, and God can bring those dreams back to life. Verse 17, the promise came true. That son was born. But in verse 18, that promise went to work with the father one day in the field and it fell. And it said, Father, my head, my head, my head. Sometimes promises grow. More problems, more work, more things. And now his head. And what did the father say? Take him to his mother. Now, when I first read that, I thought, well, of course take her to mom. Mom fixes everything. Mom finds everything. I can't find something in the house. I asked my wife, where is it? Mom always knows how to fix it. But I realized, no, 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 that's not the reason why he said take her to mom reason why he said take her to mom is she's the one that built the room. And when you build a room for God, people bring you their problem. Church planner, people bring you problems sometimes. And you want to say, hey, you think that's a problem? Let me tell you what I'm going through. Don't ever wonder why people on your job and in your community bring you their problems because they know you built a room for God. You know how to get in touch with God and they bring their problems to a person that can get in touch with God. Verse 20, the promise came home. Look what the Bible says at noontime. The promise died and it was on her knees that that promise died. Let me tell you something. Promises die in your life sometimes. Tragedy happens sometimes. Things happen sometimes you don't expect. But when that promise dies, make sure it dies on your knees. Make sure you're on your knees when that promise dies. When that trial happens, make sure you're on your knees uh, when the promise dies. Let it die if it must. But when it dies, it must be on your knees. Don't stop praying. Don't stop believing. Don't stop working. Let it die on your knees. Look at verse 21. What do you do with a dead promise? Some of you have had dead promises in your marriage, in your ministry, in your life, your finance, in your business. What do you do with a dead promise? Verse 21, she took it up to the room she built for the man of God. The reason why you must build a room for God, you need a place to take a dead promise. Promises are going to die. Where are you going to take a dead promise if you don't have a room that you built for God? She took that dead promise to the room, laid it across the bed that she made for the man of God, and then she closed the door. Because tell you what, you can't tell everybody about your dead promise. Some of you need to get off Facebook, putting all your business out there. That's just for free. I threw that in. Some of you act like teenagers on Facebook. I know every problem you have in your life. Sometimes you just got to close the door on the dead promise. And take it between you and God. Came down to verse 22 and told her husband, I need to go to the man of God. Give me a young boy and a donkey. Got to go find the man of God. Verse 23, he says, why are you going to the man of God? It's not a feast day. It's not a Sabbath day. It's not church today. Let me tell you something. <laughs> when you build a room for God, you can't wait for Sunday. You can't wait for Wednesday. You can't even wait for Monday night prayer. I need something from God, and I need it now. She said, I can't explain, honey, but I can't wait for the next feast day. I got to find a man of God, and I need him now. I got a dead promise in a room upstairs. Verse 26, she found the man of God. He says, is it well with you? Well with your husband. Well with your child. And she said, what? It's well. How could it be well when you got a dead promise? Let me tell you, when you build a room for God, somehow, somewhere you say, it is well. It is well. It is well with my soul. She wasn't lying because she knew she built that place for God, that special place that the man of God came to lie in. And she took her dead promise there and she just, it's well. I don't know how, I don't know when, but it's well because I built a room for God. Verse 32, the man of God came back to her house. 
the place that was built, and there was a dead promise laying across the bed. Verse 33, he shut the door, began to pray for the miracle he knew that God could do. Verse 34, he laid upon the child, mouth to mouth, eye to eye, hand to hand. And just like, look at verse 34, what happened? The body began to get warm. That cold, lifeless, dead promise began warming up. Miracle started, thank God. But verse 35, I find very interesting. After the miracle started, the man had got, got up and began to walk to and fro in the house. Now picture, you're this lady. You've been promised a son. The son died. Laying upstairs in the bed, as far as you know, dead in the room you built for God. And now the man that got his downstairs walking around the kitchen, walking around the living room, walking around the bedroom. And you're like, man of God, what are you doing down here? I got a dead promise upstairs. Get back up there and get to work. I don't need you down here. And sometimes in your life when you got a dead promise, the hardest thing for you is to see God at work blessing other people. See God at work in other parts of your life. He's like, but I got a dead promise up here. But you know, when God gets ready to do a miracle, he's going to do a complete miracle. Because downstairs, there was a husband that was full of guilt because he knew he was the reason his wife did not have a son all those years because he was old. And now he caused a death because of taking him to work that day. You had a wife that was full of doubt that said, you know what? The man of God told him, don't lie to me. Why give me a son and take him away? So the prophet said, you know, before I can fix Everything else, uh, while I'm down here, I'm going to fix it all. At least sometimes God operates like a mechanic sometimes does. He tells you, I'm going to change your transmission, but while I'm in this deep, I might as well fix everything else. I might as well get to work and do it all. And God's saying, you know, I'm about to do a great miracle, but before I finish the miracle, I got some more work I need to do. After he got done walking around downstairs, the man of God, he went back up. To verse 36, uh, amen. And when he got back into the room, the son, the miracle, had fully happened. He was awake. In verse 36, I find very interesting. Because I would have thought the man of God would have said, Johnny, get up. Run downstairs and give your mom a hug and a kiss. And tell her God did the miracle that I knew that he could do. But that's not what happened. The prophet told Gehazi, Go get the woman and bring her back here. Now put yourself in her shoes. The last time she was in that room, all that was in that room was a dead promise laying across a bed. And now the man of God wanted her to come back into that room. As she walked up those stairs to that room, her heart had to be breaking because she was saying, I don't want to go back there. And some of you, you have a room in your life you built for God where a promise died. And you tell God, I will sing in the choir. I'll help my husband plant a church. I'll pastor. Amen. I'll work in the Sunday school department. But no, God, I'm never going back to that room. My husband didn't even know about that room with the debt promise life. What happened to me when I was a child. My kids don't even know about the debt promise that me and my wife went through and the tragedy we went through the first time we planted a church. Uh, there's a room with a debt promise, and by now it's thinking, I will never go back to that room. I'll stay busy in other areas in the house. I'll work for God, but I, God don't make me go back to that room. The last time you was there, a dead promise used to be. You say, I don't want to go back there. Every church planner has a room with a dead promise. Every church planner starts out with so much faith and belief and say, oh, God, I'm going to set the world on fire. I'm going to set attendance records. Me and my family, we're just going to do these great things. Financial promises die. Relationships come to an end. Businesses go bankrupt. Healings don't happen in your body, in your life, in your loved ones. And you find yourself trying to work for God and build a room for God, but there's just that promise of laying across the bed that you don't want to think about, don't want to talk about. But, amen, Christ had to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and cry until the sweat dropped like blood and said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Joseph had brothers that tried to kill him. He had a promise and a dream. His own brothers tried to kill him. Jacob had to wrestle an angel in pain and said, I will not let you go until you bless me. I'm telling you, there's some rooms with dead promises in the life of every one of you. And you run from them for so long, so afraid to go back. But this woman 
had to go back to a room where the last time she was there, the room held the dead promise. A room she had built for God. She put a bed for God to lay, a table to fellowship, a throne, a stool for God to rule from, and a light for the kingdom of God. It was full of dead promises to her. But she had to make that long walk back to that room and after faith open that door and believe it's going to be different this time. I come to tell somebody that we serve a God who is a faithful God. We serve a God who is a miracle working God. We serve a God who brings dead promises back to life in the room you built for him. The story doesn't end there. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 8 with me. Amen. Look at verse 1 through 6. One day Elijah showed back up to her house knocked on the door and said, Arise and go, you and your household, and sojourn wherever you can go. You want me homeless? Just live the best way you can. For seven years, you got to leave this land. Wait a minute, God. This house I built, this room I built for you, this ministry I work, I got to walk. There. Sometimes God's calling us out of our comfort zone. We built a room. She, had a, she was a great, had a great house, great woman, great land, built a room for God. I'm never leaving this house. My son was brought to life here. He died and miracles happened here. I'm never going to leave. But sometimes God calls you, steers you up, taking you somewhere else. You never wanted to go. So the Bible says she left it all. And for seven years, she lived with the Philistines. Can you imagine that? Their enemy, their mortal enemy, a place she didn't want to be. But the man that God told her to go and she left it all. But he told her to stay there for seven years. So she counted the days down. When that seventh year hit, she said, I'm going back to get my land. I'm going back to get my room. I'm going back to get my house. And the Bible mentions her and her son coming back. Doesn't say anything about her husband. I've always wondered, did he die? I, I sometimes wonder. He maybe he decided to stay. Because, you know, within those seven years, they left and they were homeless. But within seven years, they probably had a new business, had a new house, had a new life with the Philistines. She said, honey, forget about that house. Forget about that room. Forget about that promise the man of God said, just go for seven years. We're doing okay where we are. Let's just stay here. But something inside her said, no, I'm going back for the land. I'm going back for the house. I'm going back for the room. And she got back to Israel. And the only thing she could think of to do, I'm going to go to the king. Uh, and I'm going to cry out to the king for my house and for my land. I'm going to try to explain uh, I left seven years ago because a man of God told me to leave. Uh, but that's my house. That's my land. That's my room. Somehow I'll convince the king to give it back to me. Look how God works. As she was walking up to the king in 2 Kings 8, chapter 4, the king was talking to Gehazi and said, Tell me, I pray you, a story of some of the great things that Elijah had done. And he began to tell the king a story in verse 5, 2 Kings chapter 8. Let me tell you about the time he raised a woman's son back to life, a dead body back to life. And in the middle of telling the king that story, Gehazi looked up to his surprise and said, my Lord, oh king, this is the woman right here. This is her son right here. I was just telling you about her and she happened to walk up right now in the middle of her story. Because let me tell you something, uh, when you build a room for God, your testimony will go before you. Uh, she was planning to come before the king and beg for her land, but before she could say a word, her testimony went before her because the Bible says, I will restore to you the years, the locust that's eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. Let me tell you something. Now, when you build a room for God, don't get discouraged. Uh, keep walking in integrity. Keep doing the right thing. Uh, keep following God. Uh, you got to be like Job sometimes. Uh, Job said, I don't know where God is. Uh, I look on the left. Uh, I look on the right. Uh, I look behind me. I look all around. I see nowhere God God is working. But he says, what? God knoweth the way that I take. When he had tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Uh, what Job was saying, I don't know where God is, but God knows where I am because I am right where God left me. I'm doing right what God called me to do. I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to follow the word of God. I'm going to follow what God tells me to do and let God fight my battle. And she just showed up. And the king said, what? Give her back her land. Give her back her house. As a matter of fact, calculate every fruit of her field 
for the last seven years and give it back all that harvest. Because uh, when God restores you, once you built a room for God, God's going to restore all those years that the locust, the cankerworm, the caterpillar, they took from you. God's going to do a thing because you built a room for God. You stay faithful to God. That's all you can do. Keep trusting God in the midst of the desert, in the midst of the storm, seven years homeless with the Philistines. But let God fight your battles. Don't worry about what you're going through. Don't worry about what you lost. You build that room for God. You put a bed for God to lay in. You put a table for God to feed you and speak to you. A stool for God to rule you and be a light to the world around you. Keep believing God. Keep trusting God. Keep building a place for God. And let God fight your battle. We're standing right here. Middle of Tabernacle of Hope in Tampa, Florida. My mind goes back to June of 2017. In that month, I faced so much betrayal and so much heartache and so much pain. It took all the other months of my 53 years of life. What I went through that one month would not equal that. There was just so much going on. I was facing bankruptcy in my business. I was facing trials in the ministry. I, if I had time, I could tell you the stories. You could feel sorry for me. Play, play your violins. I'm teasing because we serve a faithful God. But in the midst of that, the doctor thought that my dad needed open heart surgery. And I called my mom. I said, I'm coming up to Panama City. They're going to do a test on him and check his veins. And she said, I said, she said, don't come. You have so much going on. I said, no, I have to come. So I drove up there and we did the test. Thankfully, everything was fine. None of his veins were blocked. Surgery wasn't needed. So I had a late Saturday night. I'm going to drive back to Tampa six hours away so I can be in the room I had built for God and bring the word of God. That son I told my mom, I said, dad's doing it. My way back home, late Saturday night, on the phone with my wife, and I get an email on my phone. It's an email from a former partner in my business. Yes, I, I want to let you know I closed the account, shut everything down, closed it. Bank, credit cards at all. My wife said, what are you going to do with that? I have no idea. Monday morning, I got crews coming to the office to work. I got payroll to meet that Friday. Got no money. So what are you going to do? I have no idea. Saturday night, banks are closed. What do you do? And one thing I knew I would do, Sunday morning, I'm going to come to the room I built for God right here. We're a street corner in town, but I'm going to come right here. I don't know what's going to happen Monday, but when you build a room for God and promises die, go back to that room. You don't know what else to do. Go back to that place you, that you dug out and you believe and you trust that God. I walked in that Sunday morning, and much to my surprise, one of my guys met me at the door and said, this came in while you were gone. Yesterday, I was going to give it to you. It was a handwritten envelope. Inside the envelope was a check that had bounced around town for three weeks. Went to a different address. I didn't even know where it went to from a customer that always paid direct deposit. Three weeks, that check floated all around the city until someone put a handwritten sticker on it and put it in the mail with their own stamp. Fortune 100 company. One of the largest checks that my company ever received. And you know what? If I had put that in the bank three weeks ago, it would have been gone. But the Lord had that check bounce around for three weeks. And on the day when it looked like everything was over for me, God already had worked out my situation. Why was that? I just came back to the room I built for God. When all hope was lost, when there was nowhere else to turn, nowhere else to go, if you build it, he will come. I'll come to challenge somebody. Build that room for God. Do what God has called you. Sometimes God disrupts your comfort and says, leave and sojourn and go. But your testimony will go before your integrity. Never compromise. Never give up on what we believe. Never doubt what God can do. Build a room for God and, and put in there where God told you to put that bed, that table, that stool, that let Put it all in there and trust God and keep going forth. And when promises die, bring it back to the room. When you bring it back to the room, God will bring it back to life. Marriages are going to be restored. Finances are going to be blessed. Healing's going to happen. But you got to go back to the room you built for God where it all started and say, God, you called me to do this. I'm not trying to do it on my own. I'm going to the room I built for you, and I'm going to trust you. Heavenly Father, right now, Lord, I believe right now if we build it, you're going to come. And I challenge people that are walking right now to understand, Lord Jesus, that they will build it, and you are going to show up. So I thank you, Father, and I praise you, Lord, today for what you're doing in us, that your will be done, we pray. We're going to build it and you're going to come in Jesus' name. We are so thankful tonight for the practical and the powerful. Thank you, Dr. McIntosh, for helping us to understand a little better how to navigate these difficult times. And thank you, Brother Stewart, for reminding us that when we build things for God, He is not far off, but ever so close. 
And we also want to thank each of you pastors and leaders for joining us this year for Advance 21. Our prayer is that something that was taught or preached in these two nights will assist you in positioning your church or your department or your ministry to be ready for the growth God desires to send. If you desire to watch these sessions again or show them to your team, they will be archived. You can go to the website below for more information. On behalf of the Louisiana North American Missions team, may God bless you as you advance into great revival and harvest.